This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by TopTal. Experience a new way of hiring as TopTal delivers only the top 3% of applicants, including highly skilled blockchain engineers. If you're looking to scale your team with the very best talent, visit toptal.com slash epicenter. Hi, my name is Brian Farben Crane. And I'm Sunny Agarwal. So we're here today with Martin Kerpelman, who's the CEO and founder of Gnosis, and Martin Field, the CEO and founder of Darstack. Both of them have been on the podcast before, and today we're going to speak about this super exciting experiment that they're doing together, which is combining a decentralized exchange and a DAO. Uh, and yeah, it was a great conversation. We hope we enjoy it as well. So let's go to the interview. So we're here with Martin Kerpelman and Martin Field. So both of them are, you know, back on the podcast, have been here before. Martin actually twice, so your third time here. And Martin was here three years ago. Uh, so quite a long time ago to speak about Gnosis. So we're going to speak about a very interesting project, which is the Dutch Exchange and the DX DAO. So yeah, thanks so much for joining us today, guys. Well, thanks for having us. Thanks. So maybe we can start with you, Martin. So we, we spoke about Gnosis before, and, and you know, of course, some people will also, some listeners will also be aware of Gnosis because you guys were, uh, you know, sponsoring the podcast last year. But tell us a little bit, you know, what is Gnosis and what's the evolution that Gnosis has gone through? Yeah, so uh, the core of, of, of Gnosis is, um, is prediction market and prediction market uh, platform. Um, and we see prediction markets um, really uh, as a new um, asset class, basically. Uh, we recently like coined the term uh, conditional tokens because it's it's really a lot of you can do with prediction markets. You can give any event a likelihood or make make a market for the occurrence of any event, but you can do much more. You can do uh, you can um, see how any event is influencing any other event. Um, so so how is one event hap happening influencing the likelihood of another event happening? But it's also useful for stuff like how does one event happen happening influence the price of 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 any asset, and that's super interesting also for decision making. This Futaki discussion: How does this decision influence um, stock of a company or token or something like that? Um, so we we um, say that those are yeah conditional tokens, and um, and that's yeah we we provide a framework um, for for those uh, to really create a new asset class. Uh, that's the create part uh, of Gnosis. And then we have a trade part of Gnosis. So we have all those new conditional tokens that needed to be uh, traded somewhere. And that became more and more the, the, the focus uh, of Gnosis to provide efficient trading mechanisms for this new asset class, but in general for, for tokens. If you, if you build a trading mechanism, you, why wouldn't you, I mean, you would allow to, to, to trade anything that's, uh, or from a technical perspective, it doesn't make that much of a difference what you trade there. So uh, create, trade, and the third thing we, that's somewhat, or 100% related to our initial vision is, is the hold part, create, trade, hold. A um, little bit like historically, we started uh, to build a multisig wallet because there was no, and we wanted to do a token sale, so we wrote a multisig wallet that was able to hold tokens that became almost the industry standard. Uh, almost every ICO is, was, is using it. Um, and we realized, well, we, we should like continue that and su support that uh, and bring that, uh, that additional security of a multisig wallet uh, to consumers. Um, so have a smart contract wallet where you as a consumer use a multisig wallet um, uh, and you ha have multiple keys R right now in the first setting that's an also safe. You have, for example, one key on your phone, um, one key on your computer or wh where wherever, um, and it it's a convenient way uh, to use it. So that's in short what Gnosis is currently doing, create, trade, and hold. Very cool. That actually makes a lot of sense. It helps me like that. I, I put all like your, you know, your major projects that you guys have been working on in like context. Um, so what are some of like the, 
uh, updates since like the last time you were on. So last time uh, you guys were on was three years ago, summer 2016. Uh, a lot of stuff has changed since then. Uh, in fact, the last time that you were on, we were actually talking a lot about the DAO. And so it's kind of interesting that now we're here talk, going to be talking today about the DX DAO. Um, but so, so one of the things like, you know, since then you guys have spun out of consensus, uh, you guys have done your own token sale, which like in my eyes was like, you know, I think it was in April last 2017. And in my eyes, I see like the Gnosis ICO as like the ICO that kind of like kicked off ICO craze. And so how was uh, that whole experience for you guys? Yeah, well, it's quite a ride still, right? Um, um, yeah, I think you mentioned or the, the token sale was obviously, uh, uh, well, ch changed a lot. Before the token sale, we were like a company of, or we were still part of consensus until um, today we are a company of 50, 50 people um, working on those three big, big, big topics. We, yeah, I, I guess we, we were lucky with the token sale, with the timing, um, uh, Ether appreciating, sell, selling a bit uh, at the right moment. So we kind of have, are in a good good position, have a decent runway of many years. Um, um, I think it went very well and we are in a good position, but still, still, uh, there's so much work. There's so much like, infrastructure is still missing I, I, that's just the case um uh so yeah um i mean the decision to b build stuff like uh, exchanges um or exchange technology and um and yet another wallet uh, was not something we um we did lightly or i mean we we obviously looked at at uh, the hundred other DEXs that are currently being built and the hundred other wallets that are uh, being built. And we still like uh, decided mm -hmm. it does not cover our needs. Uh, and we can, we do think we bring additional significant uh, contributions to the stuff we do. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, and so Matan, how about you? Uh, you know, you guys were on much more recently, uh, only about eight months ago. Um, how has, uh, you know, the evolution of DAO stack uh, proceeded since uh, last May? Yeah, so likewise, I mean, we had a pretty successful or very successful token sale um, back in May, May 2018. And then, of course, that changed a lot. We grew the company. Now we're a company roughly of 25 uh, people. Um, so that's, well, of course, that's kind of like stabilizing the company and growing the project. And then we made a lot of efforts on, I mean, we, we already had a working product before the token sale. Uh, we insisted to launch a token sale with a working product, but I think the last eight months we had an incredible um, advance in pushing the product from, I would say, a prototype into a real production ready, like a real product, a real product that is on the blockchain, but looks like a real product and works like a pre real product and has a significant value proposition, um, kind of like make it more, way more professional. So these eight months were a huge amount of effort to bring like the the most advanced technology on top of the blockchain, um, and yeah, it's really exciting. And now we're just launching that, and DX that will be one of the first, uh, um, what, what maybe with few other DAOs that we will launch with. Basically, we launched the basic platform. I mean, we already launched it. Uh, I don't know six months ago uh, on the mainnet uh, with an alpha version, which again was kind of like a prototype. But now in Q1. Towards the end of Q1, we will be launching the whole system, you know, from from the bottom end of the blockchain contracts all the way to the interface, and there are a few layers in between. So the whole system will be launched in public beta, and the DX that will be one of the first, uh, probably the first big DAO on top of the platform. Cool, and yeah, we're gonna come back to that uh, in detail in a little bit. But before we dive into the DX DAO stuff, let's talk about the Dutch exchange. So Martin, why did you guys decide to build a uh, decentralized exchange and what's different about the Dutch exchange? Yeah, for, first, because we needed a place to trade predictions. It's as simple as that. So, so uh, the prediction market obviously is, is a place where, um, where uh, it already includes uh, the word market. So I guess the next question could be, why wouldn't we use one of the uh, existing market mechanisms? Um, and that is, that is because we believe 
there is a need for a fully decentralized uh, market market mechanism. And um, most of the decentralized exchanges uh, right now are, I would call them uh, non-custodial centralized exchanges. So that means, yeah, they are non-custodial. You 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 remain in control of 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 of, of the funds, but critical p parts of the um, of the uh, of the exchange, like the matchmaking, uh, keeping the order book, uh, may maybe even deciding which which tokens uh, can be traded uh, or not, um, are in in central uh, in in centralized. Um, uh, control. And um, I, I definitely see a need kind of also for those non-custodial centralized exchanges, but I def definitely also see a need for a, like more um, a protocol layer or like 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 an infrastructure layer thing that's just slightly above Ethereum, just some decentralized protocol that allows you to efficiently exchange any token into any other token. Um, and my claim is uh, there are few that are that there are like some that are fully decentralized. So Uniswap is, for example, one, and and there is well, you can also do a full on-chain order book. Uh, Augur is doing that. Uh, Oasis Dex is doing that. So those are basically the two or the, the three only uh, um, fully decentralized exchanges I'm aware of. Um, all of them have unfortunately significant game theoretic problems around front running, around uh, being able to provide enough liquidity because the costs are quite high to uh, provide enough liquidity on those mechanisms. So the bottom line is we are really into building something that is A, fully decentralized, market mechanism is fully decentralized, um, is reasonable or is as efficient as possible of course and doesn't have any like game theoretic attack vectors uh like mine yeah minor front running is, is is a big one so could you uh go ahead and like maybe walk through us a little bit about how the dutch x system works and like you know the mechanisms of this exchange and how you know i feel most people might if, when they think of exchanges they're probably mo usually thinking of order books because that's probably what most people are familiar with so how does this uh compare to a traditional order book mechanism Right, right. So, uh, to kind of just to to, to um, preface that the Dutch exchange is, um, yeah, I would make the claim it's right now uh, the only <laughs> fully decentralized uh, a mechanism that doesn't that that cannot be attacked by with, with front running, especially from from uh, from miners. Um, so, and we had to do like compromises for that. So, how does it work? Um, yeah, it uses the Dutch auction model. So let's say, Sunny, you want to sell. What tokens do you want to sell? <laughs> uh, let's say some maker token. Maker tokens, right. So uh, so there is a pair maker, and that's actually one of the pairs that's quite active on the Dutch X, maker Ether, let's say. Um, and roughly the system starts every six hours in auction. Um, so there is a period before the auction where everyone who wants to sell maker tokens um like puts puts their maker tokens in this in this pot um and at some point the auction starts and basically the auction mechanism is now trying to sell all those maker tokens that are all in one pot uh for as high price as possible so what it will do is it will start a dutch auction so that means it starts at a high price um and high in, in our case is defined as two times the previous price so the previous price is roughly the market price um, so it starts at two times the previous price, and then the price, or it kind of it offers this to the to the market to to anyone um, who can do a Ethereum transaction on the blockchain um, at a, at a dropping rate. So so the price continuously drops, um, and now as a, as someone who wants to buy um, Maker, you can as soon as uh, as soon as the price reaches the level where you are comfortable with, uh, you can make a bid. Or you 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 can send ether, and at that point you know you have the guarantee that you will get that price. Or if the auction continues and unless you clear it, uh, it will continue. Um, you then eventually get the final price, and the clearing price is 
the price where there's enough buy demand uh, at that price to clear the, the, the full auction. And the, the pricing function goes like uh, after six hours, so it like it's, it's a one, one divided by X function, uh, after six hours, it reaches the previous price and it goes uh, all the way to zero. So after 24 hours, it basically goes to zero. So then they will, we definitely expect that they will then be <laughs> shortly before zero, there will be a buyer. I mean, I, obviously, ideally around six hours, uh, after six hours, when it reaches the market price, roughly the market price, uh, it should close the auction. And so how often does this uh, cycle uh, begin again and again? More, more or less every six hours. So, so once, once the, uh, uh, as the auction is cleared, uh, there's just a 15 minute, a 15 minute like delay period. And uh, if then there is enough volume and uh, in the current design, enough volume means at least $1,000, uh, the next auction would start uh, immediately. So on a liquid, on a somewhat liquid pair, uh, that has enough demand for a thousand dollar trade every six hours at least. Uh, yeah, it would more or less every six uh, hours um, have a cycle. And so, is the idea here that, uh, or, or like, how do you think about liquidity in this context? Is this something that you think will just naturally come because uh, there will be arbitrage opportunities if there isn't enough liquidity? Or right, so. I would say the Dutch auction is a good mechanism, or there there are two uh, there are two use cases I would say, um, maybe more. But <laughs> so one for just very illiquid for 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 illiquid tokens where you hardly have a market at all. <laughs> so their their um, uh, order book is like or. Um, they're like finding a price every six hours is already like good enough. Uh, for liquid tokens, um, why would you use the Dutch exchange? For liquid tokens, I would say you would only use it for large or you would only want to use it for a large uh, uh, volume, um, large enough volume so that on, on the uh, competing liquid market, um, you would already move the price uh, uh, significantly there because there is uh, yeah uh, slippage. Um, so one experiment we are doing uh, just the the ten days before the DX DAO uh, will start to to demonstrate this claim. Uh, we will uh, for ten days each day put a hundred thousand uh, dollar die order in. So so we are each day. Uh, selling or kind of buying ether, so selling die uh, for ether. Um, so Gnosis will basically just buy some more ether with die, um, and uh, yeah, we are very curious what 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 what, what the final price uh, will be and how it, how it, how how the final price will will compare uh, to well to the market price. At the time, so our our claim would be there is no DEX currently that can handle a hundred thousand dollar market order. The Dutch X should be uh, one that can do that, and roughly the reason is because um, because it basically gives market makers uh, the perfect the perfect setting uh, to do to do arbitrage or to to kind of uh, to 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 well trade on all on everything where they can get liquidity because it's totally predictable so so like this order is, is coming in they can see this hundred thousand dollar it's starting uh, at this high price and they see over six hours they slowly see it coming and and during this time they can do all, all the market makers all the arbitrage uh, people can like compete against each other to 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 give this um to to give that uh, order the best price compare that to a to if, if you would just put it the market order on a normal exchange uh, then you only get the price that is available at that moment. So, um, so, so here the market maker can act after they see or have the guarantee that this volume is incoming. That's really cool. Um, so a few weeks ago, we actually had uh, James Prestwich uh, on with, uh, and he works on a project called Sumo One. And so they were actually using sort of uh, cross-chain Dutch auctions where they were selling Ether in exchange for Bitcoin. 
And so it's actually very interesting to see that uh, on all of their auctions that they've been running, they've been doing something similar where they've just been putting up their own ether. And they, everyone, it's always been being sold almost at like a 10 to 20% discount every time from like, you know, the market price on like centralized exchanges. So like, you know, I, I, while reading through your documentation, I read about this like Magnolia token and stuff, like these things that will help incentivize liquidity. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what these mechanisms are? Yeah, so... Um so liquidity is of course the biggest the biggest uh, challenge uh, to to get the uh, liquidity um, uh, running and um, so basically the Dutch eggs has a, in, a built in uh, mechanism that will only kick in on February eighteenth and like in parallel to the DX uh, launch um, and that will basically it, it's a simple simple strategy that uh, those who trade earn earn it. It's a new token. The the the, the and, and 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 kind of it's, there's no pre mine or whatever. So all the tokens that it, it, uh, are purely created from trading on the on the Dutch X. Uh, and for one uh, for one ESA worth of trade, um, uh, you kind of every, every time a new Magnolia token is minted, um, and and the Magnolia token. Uh, yeah, is the token intrinsic to the Dutch X, uh, and it we have this fee, um, this this liquidity contribution. Um, so yeah, you you can think or right, from from each auction a fraction is um, uh, is is taken in in the in the order of magnitude of zero point five percent. So in something that's somewhat comparable to a fee. Uh, zero point five percent is taken out of this auction, and it's like put into the next auction as an incentive to start this auction. So, so basically, this 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 liquidity contribution is put into the next auction and will be distributed among those who uh, participate in this auction. So, if you have a lot of Magnolia, you basically um, have to pay less uh, in, for for this uh, uh, liquidity contribution. But you still benefit from others paying this uh, liquid liquidity distribution because uh, contribution because it's always uh, distributed among all all traders. Okay, so so that means if I'm like a market maker, I do a lot of trading, I get a lot of magnolia, right? And then I, I guess it's like when a centralized exchange, right? If you trade a lot, maybe your fee goes from zero point three to zero point one, and so here also the fee goes from the, this liquid liquidity contribution would go down from 0 0.5 to, you know, I don't know, 0 0.1 or something too, uh, because I have a lot of Magnolia, but then I still get the distribution each time from those who have less. So it can actually mean that uh, even if I sort of uh, trade at the same price every every auction, it, it, that's actually profitable for me. And then you ensure liquidity that way. Correct, correct. So so the, the fee is, yeah. Um, your, your effective fee is basically the fee rate or the, the liquidity contribution you are paying, uh, or, or it, it's uh, um, plus uh, the average liquidity contribution everyone else is paying. And if everyone else pays a higher li uh, liquidity contribution, you are a net gainer of, of, of that fee. So you, get, uh, get, you pay a negative fee, <laughs> if you want to put it that way. What if I just wanted to try trading with myself and just like earning Magnolia tokens? So could I create a bunch of like fake tokens and just like do auctions where I'm the only buyer and seller. Here we come for one of the reasons why we need DAO. <laughs> so yeah, so only um, uh, anyone can add any token to the Dutch exchange protocol anytime, uh, but only whitelisted tokens will uh, generate Magnolias for specifically that reason. Otherwise you create your Sunny token and you have 100% supply of it and you make a lot of fake, tra fake trades. Exactly. And that's why the, we need to DAO to curate such a whitelist. But could you still have this sort of fake trading and generation of or like me trading with myself? Yeah, sure. I mean, as soon as you use a real token um, or well, one token that's whitelisted, you can, of course, uh, well, put it on the sell side, uh, but also put it on the buy side. The thing uh, or, or also, I mean, yeah, you, you put it up for sale and then you participate yourself uh, during the auction. The thing is, uh, that doesn't hurt the Dutch X. It would even benefit the Dutch X because you're nevertheless 
providing real liquidity because, um, or at least to some extent. So uh, in a, in a, on an order book, you can specifically fill your own order. And then you, I mean, then you, you can even fake it by, by pretending, or in some models, you can fake it by pretending you broadcasted this order, but in reality you didn't, and you just like match it yourself and you can com completely, it's, it's com completely worthless to the exchange. However, here, uh, remember, you are always, or all funds are pulled together um, into, uh, in, 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 into an auction. So unless like there's no activity and you're the only one uh, putting uh, funds up for sale, um, if you then participate as a buyer, you also have to, um, well, give everyone else basically in, 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 in this auction um, that price. And if you want to make sure that you don't lose funds, um, bottom line is every trading activity provides real liquidity for those who, who just want to trade. <laughs> right. But couldn't I still, I, I find some token that nobody cares about. I mean, it's whitelisted, right? I mean, some, some people are trading it, but now I'm doing like, a, I don't know, 500,000 per every cycle and I'm just trading with myself then at least that token will be very liquid on the Dutch exchange. So, so sure. I mean, basically, <laughs> if, if, if you put in uh, 500,000, um, that means I or a random trader can like easily put in 10,000 and you <laughs> are very, very much incentivized to, to not like keep the price uh, dropping too much because you risk your 500,000. So, so you are like very much committed to give the, the 10,000 that, that kind of piggybacked on your 500,000 order a very good price because otherwise you risk that others can buy your 500,000 uh, below below market price. Yeah, I, so I guess you could think of it like, you know, the assumption is that if a token was whitelisted, there exists like some other, someone else out there willing to buy or sell it. And so therefore the Dutch X auction mechanism will work properly because of that. Yeah. Or, or, or at least I would say there is, um, there is utility provided by... Um, uh, by having sufficient liquidity uh, um, on, 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 on the Dutch X. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember a few uh, months ago when uh, we were in Berlin, you and I were talking about like threshold decryption and stuff. Uh, so is that something that's like uh, in the current version of the Dutch X protocol or is this like a future improvement? No. So, so that is diffusion, diffusion exchange. <laughs> that's its, its, own, uh, its own topic in a way. So uh, the Dutch X should really be seen as a demonstration and it's, it's live now and everything to, to to say it's possible to do something fully decentralized and game theoretically sound but it it it, it well i mean six hours that's it's of, of course a big trade-off so we are working on a much more sophisticated um exchange this batch auction exchange using snarks uh for scalability using threshold encryption for uh to to uh, uh combat like uh uh, front running and whatever, but that's more still in the, um, it's getting out of research stage and into development stage, but it's at least nine months ahead uh, or, or, or and, and until that will see the light of mainnet. Hiring is stressful. Let's face it. It's a long process of sifting through resumes and interviewing candidates without any guarantee of quality, but it doesn't have to be this way. Companies all over the place are experiencing a new way of hiring with TopTal. If you go to their Trustpilot page, you'll see that of the hundreds of people that have left reviews, over 98% were four or five star ratings, including one guy who wants to give his developer a bear hug. That says a lot. TopTal gets all this great feedback because they focus on their clients and their top priority is quality. They only accept the top 3% of applicants, including highly skilled blockchain engineers. One of these engineers is Radek Ostrowski. Radek has experience as a lead software engineer and data scientist for Sony and Expedia. Then he discovered blockchain and he became totally consumed with Ethereum. He worked as a consultant for the firm Start On Chain and his time locked app won the top quarter consensus Uport and Identity Blockchain Hackathon. Then he expanded his reach through TopTal. He worked with a bunch of clients on projects such as smart contract development and a POC that leverages blockchain. If you want to hire engineers like Radek for your team, go to toptal.com slash epicenter for a no risk trial. A top tile director of engineering will deliver your next hire in as fast as 48 hours, and you'll get $1,000 credit when you decide to hire. We'd like to thank TopTal for their support of Epicenter.
Well, let's move to the topic of the DAO. So why does the Dutch exchange need a DAO? Yeah, on, a, on, a, um, on, on, on one level, um, so the Dutch exchange is really meant to be an uh, infrastructure component uh, for Ethereum. Um, so, for example, many, many smart contract systems uh, need at some point um, the ability to just simply exchange one token for another or convert. They, they get some income in some token and they want to convert it uh, in another token. Um, and, um, and the Dutch X should be a, a mechanism also for smart contracts to do that. So remember, for example, smart contracts, they can't sign an order. They can't have a strategy for for, for to, to kind of to participate on an order book. So they need such a simple uh, simple way and they still want to get a fair price and so on. So it should be an infrastructure component. And if it's a smart contract, the smart contract can't easily upgrade itself or change itself. So, so the Dutch X needs to provide a high level of reliability, extremely high level of re reliability. Ideally, you would have the guarantee that if you kind of use it, you have the the very very high guarantee that in the next ten years, ideally in the next hundred years, you can just use uh, that thing. And um, now you are, of course, you you can do a trade-off. So so either you make it completely unchangeable uh, with no upgrade functionality whatsoever, you just deploy the contract; they're immutable. Um, which of course has the disadvantage that you can't improve it and you can't. And, and like everything you, every parameter you said, I mean, even things like this whitelist, everything has to be like uh, correct in the first, first try, and then you can never do anything about it. The alternative is, of course, you have a centralized entity that can make an upgrade, but then you also lose this, 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 this strong guarantees because you're now dependent on this central party that has, well, the keys to, <laughs> to, to it. Uh, so we think a DAO is a very reasonable, or is the most reasonable um, middle ground between, but can still provide, given that the DAO is widely distributed and has like 10,000 uh, reputation holders, uh, it, it can provide those strong guarantees that you are not reliant on a single entity and a single point of failure, if you want so, but it's still is agile and, and, and can make upgrades and improvements and, um, uh, yeah, and provide a better, better system. And so you mentioned that the, the Dutch exchange has been running for six months. So does the, the DX DAO take over the Dutch exchange smart contracts or can you, can you talk a little bit about how this transition is going to work? So when we deployed the Dutch X, we uh, we uh, well threw away the key, or that there is no way to upgrade it. So the Dutch X instance that is live right now on mainnet will be in the in this form uh, as long live on mainnet as long as mainnet exists, and maybe storage rent will eat it at some point. But whatever, um, uh, we we have to deploy a new one. Uh, we we have to deploy a new version of the Dutch exchange, uh, which has owner, uh, and, and and the DAO will obviously uh, be the owner, and the owner has yeah, like the abilities to whitelist tokens to upgrade the contract, um, in, in, in through through the update mechanism, basically do arbitrary changes. So why can't you you know use this same mechanism actually? If uh, forever, where instead of having to have a proper upgrade path, we just keep on leaving the old version of the Dutch X sitting on Ethereum and just like keep deploying new versions. And as people want to switch over to the new version, they can move their liquidity over to the new version. Right. I think I think that would be a sensible strategy if if that thing would be uh, its own like like DAP and and end users would directly. Uh, like trade on it, and then the end users could just decide to switch um, to the new version or, or, or like stay on the old version. Uh, however, if you really want to build many layers um, on top, and you see this this exchange more as again infrastructure uh, infrastructure component, uh, you want to build all the all the DeFi uh, decentralized finance applications. They, for example, those 
those uh, things or, or the, the all the margin trading that le needs um, needs a, a price feed and the Dutch X by the way should provide quite reliable uh, or hard to manipulate uh, price feeds um, they, they need a price feed they need a liquidation mechanism and, and you want to build smart contracts layers on top and, and maybe another smart contract layer on top and then only an application uh, then it becomes really messy if if all of those layers and layers have to have their own upgrade mechanisms or then um, so I, I I do think um, there is um, there are fundamental infrastructure components where ideally you can build on top of them and and have the guarantee that they that they will will run and be maintained uh, for, or, or yeah will run and have continuous liquidity uh, for for a long time and just just assume um, there would be this fork and everyone would move to the new one but there's one contract that's still running on the old one uh, and then suddenly this the old one runs out of liquidity and it's then really not anymore a very reliable price uh, price feed or you get shitty uh, <laughs> uh, prices um, yeah all those things on the other hand though isn't this also can be seen somewhat as a security security vulnerability as well where it's like you know when we're doing like programming like you know if you're this is why you do package locking where like you don't want your li your underlying libraries to just like swap out from under you break interfaces etc of course of course i mean absolutely so uh, the dx dao is a radical experiment uh, and um, it has to prove itself that it can um, can provide uh, this this level of reliability, and it has prove uh, has to prove itself on many levels. So it has to prove itself. The DXDAO has to prove itself on a like technical level. It, the, the contracts needs to be need to be uh, need to be um, well secure. <laughs> obviously, uh, it has to prove itself on a on a like yeah social or or as on a, on a game theoretic level that the kind of the the um, the actions of the DAO or the value system of the DAO, uh, yeah, there there, there are many uh, <laughs> there are many um, ifs and uh, and things that first need to be proven. But eventually, I would say uh, a DAO uh, might be able to to uh, provide those strong guarantees that it that it uh, like keeps keeps things going, does updates, does like stays on top of the uh, to, to, on top of the well, most recent technology, but doesn't, uh, yeah. But but again, you are not dependent on a single actor, but on this collective, this, this ten thousand people or maybe more. Maybe, maybe to add add some thoughts on this. So basically, well, four rules is good. So first, is two things. Four rules is one uh, only good for upgrades, but it's not good for you know many other kind of decisions that the DAO can make. So a DAO can make many decisions that a fork a rule cannot make. But I think more importantly, fork rule is good as a, fork rule is a great governance actually mechanism. It's the best decentralized governance mechanism for decisions that are very, very infrequent. So if you need to make a decision once in a year, I would say that probably, yeah, fork rule is probably the best decentralized governance mechanism. But, as, but, but once you want to make many, many small decisions, um, and now we can kind of like enter like what kind of decision, including in the, in the upgrade situation, we can, what, what do we call upgrade? Token whitelisting. Is token whitelisting an upgrade? Do you want to fork every time, you know, the, the crowd needs to decide about whether to, to, you know, to, to list a token or not? So once you are starting to speak about tens and hundreds and eventually thousands and tens of thousands of decisions a year, then fork will just make absolutely no sense. And you would have to have a DAO. Uh, to make collect decisions uh, at scale, when I and I'm saying at scale, I mean at scale in terms of throughput of decisions. But then scale of throughput of decisions correlate with scale, uh, natural scale of DAO itself. So if you have you know thousands of people, they will have thousands of ideas uh, to execute on, and that's something that simply you have to have a DAO if you want to uh, harvest that potential. So. Like, yeah, I guess that kind of actually makes a lot of sense. So I've had this, this like similar discussion a lot with uh, Will Warren from Zero X about like, you know, does the Zero X protocol really need a governance mechanism? 
Uh, and because, my, you know, I, I was kind of making a similar claim there, saying that, okay, look, you can upgrade, you can just launch Xerox V2, and then all of the relayers who are, like, you know, uh, can just point to Xerox V2. But I guess, like, sort of the big difference here is that work, my, my perception of that works for Xerox because it's centralized relayers, and they can, like, individually just choose to point to the new version of the Xerox contract. But if you're really trying to focus more on, like, the whole... A larger decentralized finance uh, ecosystem. It's kind of you know who knows what the up like you know it might not be centralized relayers who are pointing at at uh, DXDAO. I'm uh, sorry at DutchX. It could be like you know other decentralized apps that are pointing at it. So it kind of you do need like a more coordinated system than you would in something like Zero X, for example. Yeah, I mean, I I I would I would even argue, try to argue that even in Zero X, I mean the min, the minimal feature that you need. Which is maybe an upgrade once a year, yeah. I, I would say you, I, I agree with you. Like that fork is just just as good. But if I also think that for zero x, you can think of many more things that you could do in decentralized fashion, and for these you need DAOs as well. So Martin, you mentioned this, you know, this ultimate ambition, right? That something like DXL could make ten thousand decisions a year, or, or maybe more. And I guess that, that ties into very much what we spoke of you last time, right? So holographic consensus and sort of, you know, the mechanisms of DAO. So c can you explain a little bit, how is that going to work? And, and I was specifically curious also about, you know, reputation, right? There's this uh, thing called reputation, which is going to have a key role in the DX DAO. Sure. Yeah. So... So, firstly, reputation. I mean, it's a it's a it's a sensitive uh, a word, and and you know some people interpret it differently, and even more so when when you compare it with rep of ogre. So let's just cl clear the the definition. When we say reputation, we simply mean voting power. Like your the weighting of the weight of your voting is your reputation. It's just a number. Um, and but the way that this reputation is 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 you know is allocated to you can be anything you think of. It can also be related to some tokens, such as locking of tokens, and we'll probably speak about that. But reputation, is, we just mean your voting power. Um, the second thing about reputation is to say, so often people talk, when, when they talk about reputation, what they mean, and again, that's very different from the rep token of Augur, what they mean is that reputation is not transferable. Now, it is partially true, but then we need to decide what we mean by transferable. But there is, I think there is what people usually not speak about is a more uh, important feature of reputation, which is reputation is slashable. It's re deductible. So I can, in fact, while in the contract of the, like the reputation contract itself, it is non-transferable. So you cannot transfer your reputation uh, directly from an address to an address. You can do that indirectly. So I can hold my reputation in a smart contract and then have a token owning that smart contract and then I can transfer the, the ownership token to another address and indirectly transfer the reputation to a different owner. Um, so, but still uh, my reputation score that is tied one-to-one uh, -one and solidly to this address, in this case, the smart contract address can be deductible by the owner of the reputation system, which in this case is the DAO. So if I'm making something which is socially unacceptable, um, the DAO can decide to slash my reputation. And that's, in fact, that's a critical uh, element. I would even uh, say boldly that I think that's the only way uh, to fight with, for example, uh, on-chain bribery uh, attacks. So this is, uh, this is roughly about the reputation. And maybe just, just really quickly about holographic consensus, I mean, the whole problem well, well the whole the, the, the big I think the biggest problem of DAOs that was triggering this line of thoughts is that um, well basically you, you, you get into a, in, into a scalability problem right from the beginning just just as, just as, just as much as you get to scale, scalability problem uh, with consensus protocol with blockchain uh, in the same way in fact pretty analogously you get to, to a scalable scalability problem with decentralized governance, uh, and you cannot really, it seems naively, you, can, you cannot make uh, many decisions uh, that are also uh, resilient. So this, this, this started kind of like the line of thought of holographic consensus, which is basically allowing you to make decisions by relatively a, a small amount of reputation out of the DAO. So that thus they are scalable. 
but in a way that guarantees that that representative, that, that, sorry, that small group is actually representative in the sense that decision made in the, those groups actually reflect what the entire reputation system would, would think if they would just have the attention to uh, consider those decisions. So thus resiliency. So as far as I know, as far as I know, that's the only current mechanism that I'm aware of that resolve this the tension between scalability and resilience uh, in the domain of decentralized governance. And, and that's maybe uh, also one element that brought our two projects together is that that is used through, uh, that, that this is achieved more or less through prediction markets. So, uh, so you have like prediction markets uh, for the proposals and that ask the question, will the proposals, will, will, will that proposal be uh, uh, yeah accepted by by the by the vote um and that serves in a way as a as a filter or you or yeah as a way to to prioritize or like boost uh, uh boost proposals so if the market has a high confidence that this um that this um proposal will be accepted then it might be fine to lower the thresholds or the, the requirements uh for 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 the vote mechanism to accept this proposal Yeah, and maybe just to comment on that, I mean, for a long time, this, this, you know, this big question was on the table and people have uh, realized that governance systems, you know, the regular notion of governance system, you know, voting with static reputation, they are relatively resilient, but they're very not scalable. At the same time, markets are usually more effective, but they are very not resilient. You can easily manipulate them. So the solution eventually was to actually combine the two. So the, the decisions are made by voters, by reputation holders only. Um, but then in order to scale their capacity, there is another system, a market, prediction market, uh, of people who only make predictions. They are not making decisions. So they, in that case, it's in this, in this uh, manner, it's, it's uh, uh, different from computer key. The predictors do not make a decision, but they just predict what the voters will say. Uh, and by, by, by doing that prediction, they basically uh, scale the capacity. Uh, of things that the voter uh, can decide about. So uh, I have a question here. Now, <laughs> Martin, right? Like Gnosis is all about creating markets for like everything. And, and you guys made the point that, you know, reputation can be sort of transferred, right? Like it could be held by the smart contract and then maybe uh, that controls reputation. Then you could sell kind of shares in this smart contract. I mean, why not just make reputation like fully tokenized and transferable, it, it seems like almost making where there naturally a market could be, you don't allow a market or? Yeah, I mean, I mean the point, so firstly, the, the, again, the, the important point is less whether it's transferable or non-transferable. And as I said, it, it, in some sense, it's indirectly transferable, so I'm admitting. Uh, that's a conversation that Martin I, I and I had like for the past three years. Um, so it is transferable, and but but it's it's deductible, and that's really what matters. It it's it less so it's true that um, making it on chain transfer like directly transferable in a way kind of like just opens up more, you know, maybe potentially more opens up more problems, and we we see we don't see the reason to do that to do that, but it's not the main point. The main point is the deductible, uh, and and we. I, I would say that you probably can transfer and like, you can sell your reputation in a very, very small scale, like maybe to your, your brother, but you would not be able to scalably, you know, have it like an on-chain marketplace where you can, you know, buy as much reputation as you want or sell as much reputation as you want. So, so that's, it's, it's, it's similar to the situation where, for example, off-chain, you know, people talk about bribery in DAOs. So... Off-chain bribery is not, is not I, I would not call it an attack vector. So off-chain bribery is something that is very, it's very hard to coordinate and scale up. But on-chain bribery is super attack, like it's, it's a huge attack vector. So you, you want to make sure that these things are not scalable and on-chainable. If I understand it correctly, one, so the, the main reason you're trying to avoid the transferability is so you have stuff be slashable. And so if someone does something, you know, not according to social consensus, they can be slashed by the doubt. Mm. Why not, uh, you know, we, we, we have a similar problem as well in the proof of stake world. And we solve this using unbonding periods where why not have a system where, you know, it's untr if you want voting power, you have to bond the tokens. And then 
you have to go through a long unbonding period. But once it goes through the unbonding period, then they're transferable again. Has isn't that also a potential solution? This this is this is an equivalent solution, uh, and I'm just what what we're presenting is just just more generic than that. So basically, one of the ways. So in fact, one of the, the actually the relevant way the relevant way for DXDAO, but more generally, one of the way to have reputation is indeed locking some tokens. So you lock so, some tokens, and then the reputation score is simply the number that reflects how much voting power you got from locking the tokens. Uh, and and then you can actually you can play with it with the formula much more generally. For example, it can be the amount of tokens that you locked, but it can also be the amount of tokens that you locked time the time that you lock it for, or many other formula. And more generally, you can also have reputation systems that are not coming from tokens. So yes, the answer is that uh, it is equivalent, but much more general than that. And and well, maybe to jump there in, that is actually one of the. Um one of the main mechanisms how uh, the reputation of this DXDAO uh, will be distributed. So one, one thing that's super important to us is we uh, set up or we, we tried to set up um, the, the, um, yeah, the, the initial distribution of, of uh, this uh, reputation um, or the, the ownership of, if you want, or the stakeholdership of the DAO uh, to be really broad and to be kind of this, yeah, fair, decentralized, no, no, no pre-mine or no, no kind of pre-allocation to Gnosis or to to DAO stack. So there will be like uh, mainly two two things uh, or three things you can do. So one is trade on the Dutch exchange, um, or and earn those Magnolia tokens that that, that will distribute fifty percent, fifty percent of of the uh, reputation. Uh, roughly 30% will just, or not, not roughly, exactly 30% will be given to those who lock down tokens. Uh, and that will be all tokens. So we expect currently a number of like 50 ERC20 tokens that will be whitelisted on the Dutch exchange. So any uh, ERC20 token that's whitelisted and traded on the Dutch exchange, uh, holders of this token can just like lock down this token for up to a year. And depending on how much value they lock for how long, uh, they will get a fraction of that 30%, uh, 8% um, to, to or 10% to Ether, the same for just locking down Ether, uh, and the last 10% uh, will be uh, auctioned off for GEN tokens, uh, that's the, the, the DAO stack tokens, so the DAO uh, will start having those GEN tokens, and they are used to... Um, kind of subsidize uh, the governance uh, mechanism. So in a way, the DAO will uh, pay out uh, those gen tokens for successful proposals. Or more specifically, uh, it will use those gen tokens to incentivize the prediction markets um, or to incentivize for, for people to make predictions that uh, or can find good proposals. Is there a cap to the amount of reputation? Like, so what is the initial supply of reputation? Because it seems that to me that like the 50% that's distributed by Magnolia, as well as the 30% that's distributed by locking ERC-20s, both require the whitelist. But it seems that the whitelist doesn't exist until the DXDAO exists. So it seems to be like a circular uh, situation Yeah, th th that's here. one of the few things we like, unfortunately have to, well, just predefine. Um, so yeah. We have to predefine the whitelist. Uh, we basically try to do, um, or the, the it, it's somewhat random, but the top or most of the top fifty, um, maybe we can extend it to hundred uh, tokens. And if if anyone wants to be on the whitelist, they can contact us, and then we will make sure that that's also added. But I mean, we we have to like. It, it just it just worked for us because we have to evaluate each token and uh, is there is there is it actually a real token in the sense that um i mean each token is in in, in some way can be an attack vector if, if there's one malicious token then uh, then someone could grab way too much uh, yeah, yeah yeah if you're going to put your your sunny token and then control the sunny economy then you 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 you'll maliciously generate a lot of magnolia and basically wipe up the, the value of magnolia so, so that yeah, we want to make sure that there is no sunny tokens on the on the on the extended at the beginning, and then the the DAO will be the guard for 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 later on. 
Yeah. Wait, do you need price oracles for each of these tokens as well then? Well, that's exchange. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, yeah, so, so this so actually we, this it's really interesting because it's it's you're just now seeing uh, how two systems uh, use each other. So one system you a system A uses B and system B uses A, but this is just the beginning. We already have in mind, you know, I don't know, three, four, five systems that we would like to attach to that, and we already see like the bidirectional uh interdependence of them, and that's that's really the power of on-chain. Dapps, I mean, that they can really emerge and, and you know, integrate with each other uh, and keep the centralization. And that's, I think that's something that we haven't seen before. That's, that's also the power of Ethereum. So what, what about the, you know, economic value of the reputation token? Like, what, it, does it have value and what will drive its value? So, yeah, let me make this uh, outrageous statement. Uh, I think there is a... Um, small, small chance, but I would probably go on record and say it's like roughly one, well, maybe not exactly 1%, 1% chance um, that the DXDAO will be the biggest organization on earth in 10 years. <laughs> so, so the biggest organization means like control the most resources or like... <laughs> the most influential... <laughs> Yeah, control the most resources. So can you can you can you expand on that? Justify that? What would that look like? I mean, that's an uh, outrageous statement, which is of course great. Uh, but uh. right, right. I mean, I mean, I, I think that, that that we need to like like separate into parts. So uh, we really need the, here to like speak about the uh, the potential of DAOs. Um, and and I think the way Matan and me and Matan uh, ch chimp in any time. Uh, see it, it, it DAOs are really um probably the next yeah the next big uh big like step forward in 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 ways how uh, humans organize so i i like this quote that uh DAOs might be as important as the invention of of the firm uh in the 16th 17th uh, century um uh, because they they are yeah, to, to, in, in my expectation or to our expectation, the, the, on, the only mechanism that allows uh, coordination, uh, uh, strong coordination between 10,000 up to millions, uh, uh, million, mil millions of people. And um, so, so we, we think DAOs are significant, can be significantly more efficient in, 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 in decision making, in, in processing uh, processing input from from yeah ten thousand one million uh, members uh, and 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 in coming um, to to decisions. So this may be overused term of uh, collective intelligence and, and and stuff like that. Um, so that's I mean probably talk about more more about that. But that's that's roughly the, the general idea that. There is a good chance, or small. I mean, still small chance, but there's a good. There is a chance that the DAOs will really uh, be the next evolution, and will will replace firms as as kind of the the most powerful things for for humans to organize. Now we can talk about why might the DX DAO have a chance to to be uh, the first DAO that kind of achieves that scale, or it, it, it kind of makes those throughputs, uh, those those those. Um, those um, yeah, large, large achieve, achievements, and we would say uh, the timing finally might be right. So I think with the DAO two and a half years ago, we already got got an idea of like how things can explode <laughs> and go wrong, of course. Uh, but 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 I mean, beside that kind of going wrong part, it already for those who 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 were close to it. It was it was magical, kind of what what happened once once this was once this DAO was created, and suddenly all teams in the space uh, were like looking at this DAO and and trying to interact with this DAO and become part of this DAO, make proposals for this DAO. It was this huge magnet for. I mean, this was really just a period of five weeks, I, I, I believe, or I, I, I recalled correctly. But again, it, it gave already an idea of what 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 might be possible. And yeah, the DXDAO in a way um, 
does a more conservative, uh, some, some, somewhat more conservative uh, approach in the sense that it doesn't like start with a big uh, token sale, but it starts with this uh, yeah, big reputation distribution uh, period. But it is, I mean, it might decide, uh, well, it will be up to the DAO to decide to, uh, to do a token sale uh, or, or other forms of, of uh, ra raising uh, capital once once it's live. So it has the DXDAO has the full power to do anything that's that's possible um, on Ethereum right now, and that's much much more than than two and a half years ago. So this DAO can uh, well <laughs> it can have dollars. That, that, that is a trivial one, but we have now Dai and all the stable coins. This DAO can um, host well, host a website and, 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 and control content. So we have ENS and IPFS. So the DAO can host, uh, control the domain. And, uh, and, and, and that alone kind of uh, means the, the business model of, of, let's say, Bloomberg and, and TechCrunch and New York Times. Uh, I mean, basically, most of the value of those three companies is just captured by their website or by their, or by, by kind of their, their, their kind of their ability to publish information that is kind of curated uh, by them. Uh, then, then there's much more. The DAO can can take all uh, a lot of a lot of the the, 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 the smart contract systems uh, that that are uh, developed are are uh, open source. Um, it, it could deploy them. It could it could mine. I mean, projects could decide to on purpose hand over upgradeability. Um, to the DAO because they want to give up um, their centralized uh, uh, control. Um, they 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 often um, do have so yeah. Th those are a few. Maybe I can just add on that. So I I guess why why the DX DAO can be can be so big. So I think I mean I'm slightly repeating and echoing what Martin says, but I just to be more specific, um, the claim the bold claim about DAOs or expectation is that they can be sort of like super scalable organizations. So the problem of centralized organizations is really that they, they do not scale well, um, as, meaning that they can, they can scale, but when they scale, they become less and less effective. So less and less, if you wish, effective per person. And this decay factor is really, you know, it's really strong. And, you know, every time that you invent new technology, you kind of like allow to stretch somewhat that factor and then you know we we went from firms to eventually corporations, but still the the pay that you you are paying for scaling is very very big. Um, so very big organizations are very ineffective, um, and we believe that DAO, the centralized organization, actually can um, keep effectivity when they grow. And maybe we don't know, we will see. But maybe they can even increase effectivity, just like network effect. They can increase effectivity per person as they grow. Um, and if that is true then DAOs to corporations would be the same thing that network effect, you know, in the early internet days uh, were to previous uh, uh, apps. So for example, a uh, network effect based social media to previous old media, they just took over because they become more effective as they grow um, and they completely become predominant dominant in there. So there is expectation that DAOs will basically, in a way, eat up the domain of, of production in some sense. Um, and then the second thing to, to identify is that because of this exponential network effect uh, thing, then there is, there is just an a, 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 a enormous advantage for, for early movers. So basically that, that is to say that the first DAO that will be successful in that sense that it can super scale itself uh, effectively will probably the, be the biggest eventually, at least biggest in its own domain. So then the last point is just to ask whether we are ready, whether, whether the technology is in place in, this, in the sense of uh, uh, making it able to scale up and whether its, it's technology is ready in terms of not having a, a huge breakdown. Of course, we don't know, and that's why, you know, that's why Martin is saying just 1%. There's so many things that can go wrong, uh, but we want to say that the technology has matured so much in the last few years that there is some chance, some non-negligible but small chance that things are ready to scale up without a major breakdown. And if that happens and the premise that DAOs are super, are super scalable, we'll just see that the first DAO basically eating up its own domain. And then you can ask, but what is this domain? So I would say that the DX DAO is really a, De a DeFi 
uh, DAO. It's a decentralized finance DAO. Dutch is just, you know, it's first product, first asset, but uh, there are so many tools that you want to decentralize that can be decentralized uh, financial, financial tools. And if DX DAO uh, succeeds, I would, I would expect it to be the, basically the, the largest financial organization on the planet. Um, you know, without so, and of course, everything is you know, these are these are the the, the pink uh, the 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 hopeful scenario, but but uh, but of course, uh, and, and everything can go, go wrong, but uh, I think it definitely we are trying to argue that the technology has made such a such a big mileage in the past few years that that this is possible. Okay, this is uh, super fascinating. So thanks so much for explaining this. Now. In, in the traditional financial world, right, we have banks, right, and banks can get to a certain size or like, you know, different companies can get to a certain size. And I guess the biggest companies, you know, maybe they have like a million employees, right, something like Walmart. Now, you made the point, right, that the effectivity to some, te to some extent decreases, right, so there's, there tends to be this kind of limit, right, we don't have uh, companies of like super enormous or you know much more enormous size and then the other thing is we have things like antitrust law and and some government regulations that say okay we actually have to make sure that no company you know totally dominates a market now with what you're saying if what that's true right that actually there are network effects around the DAO and the, it, the efficiency increases as it grows I mean, what's the ultimate outcome here? Is that, does this mean that there would be, if, if it turns out like that, and let's say DeFi ends up being, you know, finance ends up just being eaten by decentralized finance, and then you have this DeFi DAO that, you know, completely consumes DeFi. Like, what, what is the ultimate outcome here? Right, so I, I want to cl clarify something. I mean, the problem, so yes, one problem of companies is that they cannot grow above a million people, let's say. Um, but the, the problem is harder. The problem is that not only they, I mean, even in million, even in 100,000, they are not, not, not effective and they are not effective because the interest, the incentives are not aligned. So the incentive of the owner of the company or the, you know, other influencers of the company, whether it's the owner or, I don't know, the, the, the biggest stakeholder or the CEO or the board of directors, the in their incentive and the incentive of the stakeholders and the incentive of the em employees and the incentive of the clients, all of these incentives are not well aligned. And, and that's why it's not effective. And it's not effective, I mean, you can look at it from a, from a, from effectivity point of view, it's just not effective, like it can be more effective, but you can also look at it from, it from you know, more social point of view. It's not, but then you know, I don't want to get too much of subjective you know, terms like just, but it doesn't serve the incentive of, of most of the people that are involved in that organization. That's the point. And, and if a DAO can uh, maintain effectivity at scale, it also means that by definition that it can maintain in the, in the, the alignment of interest at scale. And if that, um, I mean, all of the trust laws and regulation that you need to have in order not to have one company controlling the market is because that that company is controlled by a single person or maybe a few persons, some, some, some of these huge companies actually con controlled by a single person. And then it leads to a, such a distort of, of alignment of interest uh, of one to billion, uh, literally one to billion. And, and here we have, if, if we are right in our, you know, in our wild guess, then, then basically that, that, that body can take over the market but in a way that maintains the alignment of interest of all of those billions of people involved. Um, so you don't need to worry about the trust laws. You basically get what you get at the end. You simply get, and that's all what that was about. You simply get a very well effective and in a, in a way fair, but fair, fair is built into effective um, coordination between uh, 1 billion agents around shared interest. But um, like, you know, in modern, co in most companies today, like, you know, don't employees also have like aligned interests? Usually they have stuff like options agreements and whatnot, or, and even like, you know, something that things that aren't even traditional companies, like, I, you know, there was some news last year about like Uber and Airbnb trying to distribute uh, equity to like what are currently their contractors. So, um, you know, could we, couldn't we, don't we all already see this shift towards like, uh, sh like especially in the '90s, what you know, what, the big thing that happened in the '90s was like executives started getting paid prim compensated primarily in equity rather than salary, 
And so we already do we not already see sort of this shift towards uh, incentive alignment, even in uh, traditional companies or, you know, 21st century companies like Uber and Airbnb? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, absolutely. I mean, it's just actually strengthening our claim. This transition from centralization to decentralization, this transition from a huge distortion of interest, alignment of interest into more equitable uh, or, I don't know, balance or whatever you call it, uh, alignment of interest, is 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 evolution is is absolutely an evolutionary transition. It's the it's the Darwinistic evolutionary transition, and we see that transition happening for decades. Um, and the only thing is that each time a new technology is coming in, it enables you to set up a, 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 a you know a, a higher level of that coordination and, and incentivization alignment. But we also experience that the human grid, uh, you know, when it, wherever there is a way to take over power uh, you know so you had like system that kind of like started in in course of decentralization but then some there was some power concentration that could re-centralize them uh, and we've seen that over and over again and I think and in that sense I think the blockchain has really changed the, the rules in a sense that it allows for technology that in a way maybe cannot be captured um, I mean of course we we need to worry a lot about that and make all of the and that's all that's one of those things that can, can go, go wrong of course all of the game theoretic, uh, you know, rules here that the system can won't, won't be able to be captured uh, at some point. It's really no frontier in that sense. Um, another question I have, really quickly, about the uh, reputation token is, you know, doesn't the non-transferability in in a way maybe uh, limit the potential future decentralization of the system? Because, like, you know, a lot of Tokens today are like pretty centralized in their distribution, but the idea is that over time market mechanics will help decentralize them. But if we don't allow reputation to be bought and sold on like public markets, how do we expect? What if the initial distribution that comes out next month is like super centralized? Um, what what is the mechanism for resolving that? Maybe let me. So so first of all, I, I would say if if we if we don't achieve. Uh, like at least a sufficient level of decentralization, and I would say that kind of our internal goal is at least uh, 1,000 participants, ideally 10,000 participants. Well, the DAO will not be interesting. That's that, that one element. The other element is if it gets like this sufficiently decentralized initial distribution, uh, of course uh, it needs to like have much more uh, reputation uh, holders over time. And there are uh, already ways uh, built in uh, that, of course, new reputation is issued. So uh, one one thing that is by default built in into the protocol is anyone can make a proposal uh, towards um, this DAO. Anyone. Uh, you don't have to have a uh, reputation. If that uh, proposal is accepted by the DAO, you will gain. Uh, you will get some uh, some reputation. And we just like today did the, the math. Um, uh, roughly, I think the numbers we uh, or we were trying to set those parameters, uh, how, how what what all those should be, and we roughly kind of said um, if the um, if if, uh, if if the DAO runs successfully for one year, and successfully means like there are constantly proposals, there are constantly uh, like well accepted proposals, uh, then after one year uh, it should distribute another thirty percent. Uh, or in kind of a new 30% uh, uh, reputation in, in, in this first year to those uh, who, who made those um, proposals. So in theory, also, the DAO could, you know, decide to print a bunch of new reputation and then auction that off on DutchX. Correct, correct. I mean, it, well, it, it could do that, or, um, I mean, it could it could also just decide to uh, continue, like, incentivizing... Uh, like trading on the Dutch eggs, if it says, okay, there's not enough liquidity, uh, then it would just do the, the Magnolia or whatever, whatever, whatever it thinks is, is useful to grow the DAO or to grow the ecosystem it, it will control over time. But, but just, just chime in, I mean, again, we said that, that there is an assumption here. We said that more decentralized is better. So if that is true, then if the DAO will, even if, it, even if it is, you know, let's say that the, the first phase of distribution was, you know, just mildly successful and rather than the expected 1,000, you know, reputation holders, we just have 100. 
But the thing is that if those 100 believe in the agenda of the DAO, if they believe that decentralized is good, they then have the incentive, the interest to keep on distributing reputation. So they can, you know, they can distribute reputation in so many other ways um, and they just have the incentive to grow and grow that, that DAO. Secondly, there is also the mechanism of delegation that of course is another way to kind of like, uh, you can have a, a, it's kind of like a mild form of transferability of reputation uh, that can be retractable or not retractable depending on the condition. So, so yeah, just to say that definitely the centralization of reputation is important and we more so, we are saying that it's evolutionarily advantageous uh, and, and thus will happen. And if not in the first DAO, in the second DAO that will make it better. I, I guess before we wrap up, uh, I'm curious. So, it, do you see, you know, if the Dutch uh, of the DX DAO becomes this DeFi DAO, do you also think that, that in the future maybe something like Gnosis prediction markets would be managed by the DX DAO? Uh, so certainly, yeah. So, so I mean, we 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 are like. Um, we are not yet going all in on on, on the on the on, on the DX DAO, but if uh, if it would like turn out to be a, a DAO that gives kind of the guarantees, uh, like we we would trust the DAO that it would make reasonable decisions, then of course uh, if we have a, a, any smart contract system that that needs or that uh, needs to have some maybe parameter change upgrades. Uh, we would probably always give that power to to the yeah to the DX DAO because again we we think uh, platforms are more attractive uh, if they are uh, decentralized it's more attractive to build on top of a, a decentralized platform we want to build uh, decentralized platforms and that's all that that means we have to give away uh, uh, control and we think the DX DAO or something like the DX DAO is the right thing to give it to. I guess I have another question sort of related here so is there a role of the gno the gno token somewhere here yes so the gno uh, well not 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 in the in the dx dao so or not directly yeah not not in the dx dao um and again that was important to us that um that um yeah the, the dx dao should not be a gnosis dao um there is right now uh, uh, a role for GNO in the Dutch X, and that is something super interesting uh, to like watch. Um, so, so right now I, I described this this um, liquidity um, uh, this liquidity contribution uh, mechanism and the Magnolia. So that's one part. So you can like have a lot of Magnolia, uh, and that that gives you again an advantage by paying a little less uh, in, uh, liquidity contribution and effectively gaining fee. And the other thing you can do is you can use OWL and that's, that's kind of, or the, that was always, is always the idea behind Gnosis or GNO that you lock down GNO and you get fee credits and we call them OWL. Pre, like two, two and a half years when I was last on the show, I, it was called Wiz still, but now we call it all OWL, whatever. Um, so right now, in, in, in the DX DAO uses OWL. So you can pay part of this liquidity contribution in OWL. So roughly that means if you have GNO and OWL, you kind of get the slight advantage, similar like you can get the advantage with, with the Magnolia. Um, and it will be super interesting to see uh, what, what the DAO does with that. So in theory, uh, the DAO could fork out um, uh, GNO. Just to say, just to be precise, I mean, not not fork out in the sense of blockchain. Not even, I mean, that we we don't we want that would wouldn't it wouldn't even to change the whole contract. It can just it has the ownership and an ability to change the logic and basically kick out uh, a GNO. But then we also believe that there is actually advantage of the DAO uh, to maintain. Uh, it, maybe and we'll see how it you know how, how it plays out. But maybe the DAO has incentive to be aligned with the Gnosis economy. Right. So, 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 kind of the the the, the way we we well, envision it is that there will be those those many um, uh, or the, the, the reputation holders of this DAO will be uh, token holders to 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 a larger extent of of all the different token uh, projects, uh, and then they kind of prove that by locking down uh, tokens. So, ideally, the, the DX DAO will have like part of the Gnosis community, a part of the ZRX community, a part of the whatever. Uh, um, 
call them, I don't know, status and, and, and many others. So uh, ideally, the, the DAO will have um, shared interests uh, with those groups and, and, and we would see Gnosis as a, as, as a company um, uh, as like someone interacting with this DAO and, and probably once in a while making proposals to, to build stuff uh, for, 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 for that DAO. And uh, ideally, the DAO would see that as valuable, <laughs> and therefore not, don't fork out, fork out, you know. But it's uh, it's uh, that is definitely in uh, the risk. I, I guess we are taking if you believe in decentralization, if you believe in giving up control. Yeah, that's a consequence that uh, you give up control and you risk that you lose control. <laughs> cool. Well, thanks so much uh, for coming on, guys. It was uh, really, really interesting to speak about. Uh, I mean, I also remember, you know, back back in the day, we did episodes about the DAO when that was happening. And, and I, I remember that you know, incredible momentum and excitement around that. And certainly it's, it's so, it was so obvious back then, even though this was such a primitive attempt of the incredible power that DAOs have so if you know finally we're at the point where this is kind of coming back and maybe with a much different level of maturity that's something incredibly exciting now we're gonna have of course links to a bunch of different stuff but probably some listeners do want to get involved uh and you know participate in the DAO do you guys have some uh maybe final words or pointers or what should people look out for what's the timeline here so one final word is, uh, this thing is risky. DAOs have unforeseeable consequences. You can lose everything you, uh, you, you kind of, and so on. So <laughs> if you do it with that expectation, uh, then, uh, well, one, one ad, I mean, th definitely the, the DAO stack channels and the Gnosis channels are channels where we will get relevant information. dxdao.daostack.io, I believe, um, is, is, will be the website where from starting February 18th, um, this this uh, this initial distribution period of the of the reputation uh, will start, and you can there do the different actions like locking down tokens and so on, uh, and get of course all all all, all the relevant information. Uh, and this period will then um, this period will go for 30 days. Um, so for 30 days starting February 18th. Um, yeah, you can do all the actions to be, become part of um, the DAO, and then uh, there's like just a two weeks like cooldown or kind of uh, initiation period, and then starting early April, the DAO is live and 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 develop uh, its own life. And maybe just one one last comment. Uh, so with Gnosis, we made um, we obviously. Um, yeah, obviously, Gnosis and DAOstack are like, like kicking off uh, this DAO, but it's it's really important to us to to uh, make it clear that this is, this is not a Gnosis DAO. So we already made the the um, the pre commitment, and we will make this announcement a few times. We will burn all bridges on uh, April, early April. So basically, I, I, once this um, once this um, initiation period is over, we will. Uh, we will basically say Gnosis involvement is over for now. Uh, Gnosis involvement is over. Maybe eventually we will then start again, like in, in, interacting with the DAO as, as the script is for. But at that point, we will basically say either this thing develops its own life and kind of does something out of its own, or it will die, and we will let it die. We will, we, we won't we won't do anything. So we will we will close our uh, GitHub repository. We will close kind of. Uh, the 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 communication channels and we really want to it it should develop its own like ways wh where where does it communicate how do people uh, coordinate uh, we think really i mean we saw like projects like like uh, like well obviously bitcoin that it helps uh, that at some point uh, the creator uh, steps back and 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 allows the thing to become uh, to be not limited by the creator, basically. Yeah, maybe to add, um, so I mean, of course, as, as Marty says, like DAOstack and Gnosis channels are are open. And although it is, 
like I said, we're we're you know burning us all bridges, and 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 DAO stack analysis will not you know will not drive. We'll just be linked to technology, but will not drive will not drive the DAO once it's alive. Uh, it has a life of its own. But uh, there are some places. I mean, so firstly, there is a, there is a forum that we're setting it up for that. And again, we're not we don't want to have any ownership of that forum, but uh, uh, we're setting up a forum where people can speak. So it's it's the DAOTalk.org when you can already go there, uh, DAOTalk.org and um, right now, well, of course, right now it's not live, so there is no no discussion, but we, you know, people can decide on their own to have a discussion there. Secondly, you know, we, we're building the whole stack. So in that sense, you know, we build the contracts and the protocols and, and you know, and more layers of technology. But at the end of that stack, there is an interface, um, which is called Alchemy, uh, which is right now under the domain uh, alchemy.daostack.io. So that's an interface that could be, uh, you, through which you can operate uh, or participate in, in the DAO. Uh, but again, we have no wish to have a control on that interface. And in that sense, uh, there's there's already a bunch of other alternative interfaces by independent uh, actors that are being built up to also serve as gateways to the DAO. But anyway, you can you could you could find you can participate in that DAO through that interface, uh, and of course uh, participate in the reputation bootstrap period uh, to get reputation. Yeah, I, I would mention uh, that that is I, I would recommend everyone looking at um, the the. Um, Genesis DAO, so so that 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 is the DAO stack uh, or a DAO that's running uh, right now, and you can it, it's kind of much more limited, I guess, in in in, in scope and but it, it's super interesting to see uh, like it, it currently has like hundred twenty people, Matan maybe, yeah. um, and it, it's super interesting already to see or to to feel like it. It's developing its own life. It's it's developing its own rules. It's developing its own uh, value set, and you can there. Yeah, it's a simpler and earlier version of the protocol, but you already can get a sense uh, how the DX DAO then might look like. Right. So if if you go right now to alchemy.dao.io, you indeed will find the Genesis DAO. Right now, there is only one DAO there. It's Genesis DAO. Uh, it operates in the, under the alpha version of the stack and the interface and the protocol and everything. It's clunky. It is slow. It is you know it has a bad UX. It's you know everything that you you wouldn't like from a product. And yet uh, you know we just launched it completely anonymous, like completely quietly with 50 people, and now it just grow to 125. Um, it and produced, it's constantly making actually stuff. Yeah, so it produced just... it produced 200 proposals, out of which I think 60 something has passed. Uh, out of those six something proposals, there were documents, few interfaces, modules, browsers, uh, three meetups, um, like things that we haven't, you know, a suggestion proposal that we haven't thought about. And, we you know, we could not, we can definitely not, I, I guess it's it's surprisingly an, an effective way. We, we kind of like fueled, we funded that DAO. This was kind of experiment. And I think it was a super effective way to uh, to get a return on that, on that fund. Um, so this is just a sandbox. It's a prototype, and very soon in this Q1, bef before even the, 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 the DX DAO launches, um, we will launch the, the the system in beta. It will be a completely different world, different application, uh, much you know, much more slicker, fast designed, um, many more features, and so on and so forth. So, but yeah, so we are we are we are waiting for the beta. Cool. Well, Martin and Matan, thanks so much for coming on. I'm really excited to see how this all turns out. Sounds like an amazing experiment. And yeah, I'll be following it closely. So thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, the guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.